Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your resurrection. We thank you for those in the past who have seen and who have spread that good news, that good news that comes to us today. Lord, may we be blessed even when we do not see that we might be yet led to faith and trust in you. In your name we pray. Amen. So I have this tendency that drives my wife crazy. She'll tell me something, and rather than just taking her word for it, I have to turn around and look it up for myself. Like just yesterday, I did it again, and I wasn't even thinking about it. So the thunderstorm rolled in in the morning, and one of the kids was like, where does thunder come from? And my wife, she's smart, she said, doesn't thunder come from lightning? I thought, I don't know, maybe, maybe it does. I'm not going to take your word for it. So I pulled my phone out and I looked it up and guess what? She was right. I read, thunder comes from lightning moving through the atmosphere. (sighs) Now, Often what my wife does in moments like this, she's patient with me, she understands my tendencies, but sometimes she gently chides me using a Greek phrase that I taught her years ago, oligopista, which means, oh, you of little faith. (laughs) Didn't you trust me? Now, I don't know if any of you can relate to these moments where somebody says something, and rather than just trusting what they say, rather than just taking them at their word, you have to investigate it for yourself to try to understand it. And I would argue this is a universal human tendency, because all of us have doubts. And sometimes it's doubts related to what a person says, But sometimes it's doubts which are much deeper, doubts about what we believe and even whether we believe. And if that's where you are this morning, you're in the right place. Because we're going to have a conversation today about how we deal with our doubts. And maybe it's not that you have doubts. Maybe it's that somebody else in your life has doubts. Maybe it's as a parent or a grandparent and you're, you see your kids or your grandkids and they're going through those turbulent teenage young adult years and, and you've told them what to believe. And yet now you find that they're pushing back against that. Rather than just taking you at your word, now they're asking questions. Now they're like, I don't know. I don't know, is, is, is this what I believe? And maybe it's freaking you out a little bit today. And I would say you're in the right place because we're going to have a conversation today about dealing with our doubts. And what I want you to know is that you're not the only one who has ever had doubts. In fact, you can look through the pages of Scripture and there are people, even people that we would hold up as pillars of faith. People like Moses. Moses had his doubts. Really? Can God use me? King David, in his darkest moments, had doubts. Where is God? Is there a God in this moment? The prophet Elijah had his doubts. Even Mary, the mother of our Lord, had her doubts. Even Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, had moments where he doubted, are you the Christ or should we be expecting somebody else? All these people we hold up as people of faith and yet mixed in amidst their faith, they had moments where they questioned, moments where they doubted. And I want to look today with you at the story of another doubter. In fact, he's earned that moniker, that nickname. We still call him Doubting Thomas. He's one of Jesus' disciples. So let's take a look at his story. This is in John chapter 20. And we'll pick it up at verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples said, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So here's the scene. 
It's the evening after the resurrection of Jesus. And, and Jesus has appeared to his disciples. And they are elated. They're overjoyed to see him. But there's one guy who's missing. Thomas. He's not there. Now, why isn't he there? We don't know. I have my guesses. I think maybe it's because Thomas didn't want to be around people. Thomas was in a place where he was grieving. And some of you, you've been in that place where you've been grieving the loss of someone and you don't want to get together with everyone else. You don't want everyone else to see you a mess of emotions. You're like, just leave me alone. I just want to be by myself. So this is Thomas. He's, he's not there. He's somewhere by himself. But what do the disciples do? After they've seen Jesus, they go, they find Thomas and they're like, hey, dude, you missed out. Guess who we saw? We saw Jesus. This is like the day after the big game and everyone's talking about it and you're like, hey, you saw the game last night, right? You saw what happened. Uh, no, I have no idea. Why don't you tell me what happened? Oh, you missed out. I mean, it was fantastic. Jesus showed up to us. And what's Thomas's response to this? He questions. He pushes back. He's not ready to take their word for it. It's like, you know what? I have some serious reservations about the resurrection. And rightly so, because from Thomas' perspective, dead people stay dead. They don't come back to life. And so he needs tangible proof. He wants to see the scars. He's like, unless I can see the, the place where the spear was driven into his side, unless I can see the nail marks in his hands, I am not going to believe Thomas has some pretty serious doubts at this time. And I want to pause here and just recognize something. When it comes to doubts, there's a spectrum. There are people on the one side who have brazen unbelief. And on the other side, there are people who have legit questions. So not every doubter is the same. Some people who have brazen unbelief, they're like, I don't get it and I don't want to get it. I don't care. People on the other end of the spectrum who have serious questions are like, I don't get it. I want to get it, and here's what it's going to take for me to get it, but I'm not there right now. Where's Thomas in this? Thomas has some pretty serious questions. He wants to believe, but he's not there yet. The difference in approach is where somebody's heart is at. Someone who has brazen unbelief, their heart is stubborn. They don't want to believe. The other person, their heart is seeking. They want to believe. They just don't get it yet. Think of it in terms of a student in a classroom. Anybody who's ever worked with students know that some kids, they don't care. They're checked out. And it's really hard to have a conversation with them to help them to learn something that you think matters, but they're like, no, it doesn't matter. I don't get it. Then there are other students. They're the ones raising their hands. They're the ones asking questions. And what do you do? You slowly come beside them and you process those questions with them so that they can come to a place where they believe. This is where Thomas is. This is not brazen unbelief. This is, all right, guys, if I'm going to believe what you're saying, this is the proof that I need. So what does Thomas do with his doubts? This is critical for us in the midst of this story. Thomas shows up with his doubts. He doesn't check out. He doesn't look at the disciples and say, you guys are crazy. I'm out of here. No, if you look at the story in verse 26, it says this, A week later, Jesus' disciples were in the house again, and here it is, and Thomas was with them. And this is what I would encourage you to do. If you have doubts, as you have doubts, keep showing up. Sometimes we present the church as a place for people who have strong faith, but guess what? There are people here who have struggling faith as well. 
And this is a place for you as well. Sometimes we're strong, but sometimes there are moments where tragedy hits and tragedy rocks our world and it causes us to question everything that we've ever believed. That's where Thomas finds himself. And yet even in the midst of that, when he's struggling to believe, what does he do? He shows up with the other disciples. And this is what we have to be as a church The church needs to be a place where people can bring their questions and their doubts. In fact, I love it. I love it when people come to me and say, Pastor, I don't get this. I'm struggling with this. Can you help me to process this? And I'm like, come on in. This is the right place. And even for those of you who have kids or grandkids who who are maybe questioning their faith, I would say, don't panic Instead, slow down and be patient with them and take the time to process it with them. Because here's the truth. Our doubts don't need to drive us away from God. Our doubts don't need to drive us into unbelief. Our doubts can actually drive us toward God. Our doubts can actually drive us to a deeper faith. And so if you're here today and you've got questions and you've got doubts, but you're still here, I applaud you. Because this is what Thomas does. Thomas shows up even with his doubts. And when he shows up with his doubts, guess who else shows up? Jesus. Jesus shows up to him in his doubts and he does two things for him. He offers him peace and he offers him proof. First thing he does is Jesus offers peace to Thomas. He shows up in the room and he says, peace be with you. This is a common Jewish greeting, which means I want everything to go well for you. Jesus doesn't show up to Thomas. He doesn't chide him. He doesn't chew him out. He doesn't say oligopista. He says, peace. Peace be with you, Thomas. I'm here for you. I'm here with you. Let's sit down and process this together. And Jesus does the same thing for you. As you show up with those moments where tragedy has rocked your life, where you have some pretty serious doubts that you're deliberating, Jesus shows up to you and he offers you peace. And he says, I'm for you and I'm with you. And I'm here to process this with you. Which then leads me to the second thing that Jesus does. He offers Thomas proof. Now, we don't even know that the disciples go to Jesus and they're like, hey Jesus, so Thomas said as long as he can see the nail marks, then he's going to believe in you. Jesus just knows. Like he shows up and he says, Thomas, I know what you need. Come here. See the nail marks? Look at my side. Stop doubting and believe. And I love the way that this is depicted within artwork. So in 1601, there is an Italian artist named Caravaggio, and he does this painting called The Incredulity of St. Thomas. And you can look at it, and Jesus is like, here, here you go, here you go, look at this. And Thomas just peers right in there, like he's a student investigating this. I gotta make sure I got this right. Yep, this is Jesus. And doubting Thomas goes to shouting Thomas. As he emits this beautiful statement of faith, my Lord and my God. A very simple statement of faith which was used as a creed in the early church. What do we believe about Jesus? Because of the resurrection, we believe that he is our Lord And he is our God. And this shows the personal dimension of faith. It's not enough for somebody else to believe. We want our faith to be a personal expression of what we believe for ourselves. And so Thomas says, my Lord and my God. This is sometimes why I question my wife. Not because I doubt her but because I want to investigate it. I want to thoroughly understand it for myself. 
And this is the stage that young adults go through. And I would say learn to be okay with that. They're not pushing back against you. They're taking everything that they experience in life and they're trying to process it and they're trying to come to this place where they can say for themselves, this is what I believe. Because they can't ride into heaven on the shirt tails of your faith. It needs to be their faith. And it's a faith that Jesus comes beside them and enables them to have. Just as he was patient with Thomas and his doubts. Just as he offered peace to Thomas in his doubts and gave him the proof that he needed, he's going to do the same thing for us and for others in our lives who have their doubts. So what happened after this? What happened to Thomas? Because certainly that moniker, Doubting Thomas, that, that didn't stick. That's not who he continued to be. Church tradition tells us that Thomas in 52 A.D., took the good news about Jesus Christ to India and worked tirelessly to make sure that people there knew that message, that Jesus was Lord and God, that Jesus had truly risen from the dead. Because Thomas believed those words from John 20, verse 31. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you might have life in his name. He'd experienced that personally. He wanted them to experience that, so he gave his entire life to that. For 20 years, he worked tirelessly to spread the gospel of Jesus to India until 72 A.D. when he was arrested, when he was tied to a tree and he was told to renounce his faith. And his response was this, never can I deny the one who died for me. That's not doubting Thomas. That's a man who's utterly convinced of what he believes. Never will I deny the one who died for me. And when he spoke those words, they took a spear and they drove it through his heart and Thomas died. As a man confessing the faith. I want to close with this story. So there's a man named Gregory Boyd. He used to be a professor of religion at Bethel University in St. Paul. And a number of years ago, he wrote a book called Letters from a Skeptic. Here's a little bit of the backstory there. So Boyd became a believer in his late teens, early 20s, as he investigated the truths of Christianity for himself and became utterly convinced of it. But his father, Ed, was not a believer. In fact, he was an agnostic. He's I I don't know, I don't get this, I don't understand this. Even borderline brazen unbelief. And Greg tried to have conversations with his dad, but unsuccessfully, and some of you know how that goes. People just push back against you like, I don't want to hear it right now from you. But in the late 1990s, Greg had this idea. Maybe if they couldn't talk things out face to face, maybe they could write letters to each other. So he said, Dad, I want you to take all of your questions about Christianity, all your questions about God, all your questions about the Bible, and I want you to write them, and I'll write back to you. Little did he know that God would begin to open up the heart of his dad through that. And dozens of letters later, in 2003, at 73 years old, Ed Boyd became a believer in Jesus as well. He too was able to make that confession, my Lord and my God. I share that with you because sometimes it takes a lot of patience. Not panicking, not freaking out, but consistently showing up to people, offering them peace, and patiently processing all of the questions, all of the doubts that they have, knowing that at the end, Jesus will show up to them. Jesus will give them what they need. So, today, in the midst of your doubts, may you know that you are in the right place. And in those doubts, may you find a Jesus who shows up to you, a Jesus who offers you peace, and a Jesus who offers you all the proof that you will ever need. Because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.